12 Nostalgically Awesome Saturday Morning Cartoons Based on Movies None of us can really forget waking up on Saturday mornings, rushing to our TVs, and tuning into Fox Kids or NBC to watch our favorite cartoons. I remember you. Egon, move! The world of cartoons was a blissful place, and it was also a huge money-making industry for the corporate giants of animation. These shows also helped many directors to expand the universe of their films for a much smaller price than offered by a live-action show or an anthology of films. It's a little hard to come by. Marty, I'm sorry, but I'm afraid you're stuck here. Furthermore, they could show exotic locations and extremely cool technology or gadgets in animated shows, something that was not always possible in other mediums, due to the restraints applied by lack of cinematic technology or adequate funding. Naturally, animated shows were a favorite of viewers, filmmakers, producers, and yes, a few parents. Most of the Saturday morning cartoons from the 80s and the 90s came with moral lessons for children. I mean, even at this age, if Batman or Iron Man came and asked me to do something, I would be more inclined to follow their instructions. Though I wouldn't listen if my elder brother asked me to do the same thing. Deal? What do you say? Deal. Deal? Kids tend to have similar psychology. In this video, we will take you on a walk down memory lane and reminisce about 12 memorable cartoons that you may or may not remember. Just a side note, there have been numerous amazing animated shows that were adapted from live-action films, but not all of them made the cut on this list. While we have included many classics, we also choose to include a few shows that have been lost in time but deserve to be found and watched. So, you may not find hits like Jumanji, Men in Black, or The Mask here. Before we get into the explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click from you, but it means a lot to us. Thank you. Let's begin! Conan the Adventurer, 1992-1993 A young Conan lived happily with his family in Samaria. One day, he saw a meteor striking the Earth, and, curious, Conan brought a part of the meteor to his father, who was a blacksmith. Conan's father extracted the core of the meteor, which he named Star Metal. From this otherworldly metal, he forged various tools and weapons which wouldn't rust, bend, or break. His most incredible creation, however, was the sword that he forged specifically for Conan. He placed the sword under a massive heavy rock slab and told Conan that he could have the sword when he was older and strong enough. When you're man enough to raise this stone, then the sword... However, everything was about to change, as the evil Serpent Man and wizard Rathamon found out about the Star Metal and its powers, including the ability to open portals between different dimensions. Rathamon needed the metal to open a portal and go to the dimension called the Abyss. It was the place where the Wizards of Earth banished his demonic godset for trying to enslave humans. The humanoid snake found his way to Conan's family and asked his father to hand over the star metal. But when Conan's father gave him an undesired response, Rathamon used his magic to turn Conan's entire family into living stones. Conan had ventured out to retrieve his sword so that he could stop the serpentine wizard, and upon his return, he swore to his god Krom that he would make Rathamon pay for his misdeeds and bring his family back to normalcy. And that was the beginning of Conan's adventures, his quest for justice, and his struggle to save his family. I will find you, Rathamon! Conan would search all of Hyboria, and often come face to face with shape-shifting serpent men and other henchmen of Rathamon. But, with the star metal sword by his side, Conan was not an easy target for the bad guys. The animated series is based on the 1982 film Conan the Barbarian which was in turn an adaptation of the character Conan, created by Robert E. Howard. The cartoon series became a favorite among children with all the swords and sorcery, but it didn't appeal much to the elder audience. Conan stood for barbarianism. He didn't think twice before slashing someone, and would further his plans at all costs, even if the means were unethical. Destroyed? Just as one day you will be destroyed! <laughs> However, the cartoons couldn't really show the brutality and cunningness of the character, so they toned things down and made him an all-good hero. For instance, there's a scene where Conan the Adventurer refuses to steal. Well, because it's bad. Likewise, in the film, the snake cult massacres Conan's village. But in the cartoon, Rathamon just turns Conan's family to stone. In addition, the cartoon series and the 1984 live-action film Conan the Destroyer had a character named Zula. 
In the film, Zula was a female warrior bandit played by Grace Jones, while the animated series portrayed Zula as a black prince with the same build as Conan, the character being voiced by Scott McNeil. Despite these differences, Conan the Adventurer remains an absolute favorite for many of us. Rambo Rambo, Force of Freedom 1986 Rambo was part of a special forces unit called Force of Freedom, and he came into regular conflict with an evil organization named Specialist Administrators of Vengeance, Anarchy, and Global Extortion, or SAVAGE. Get me Rambo. The show featured a mix of real and fictional countries and places. For instance, in the first five episodes, most of the action takes place in or around the country of Tierra Libre. General Warhawk, the leader of Savage, wishes to take control of the country by any means necessary. First, Warhawk steals a warplane called the Spectre in a bid to seize power, but Rambo is able to stop him. Next, he plans to abduct the president's daughter when he visits the United Nations. To achieve this, Warhawk sends Mad Dog, the leader of a biker gang. Warhawk also uses the battleship Yamato in his bid to capture the country, but Rambo saves the day once again. <laughs> Too bad they didn't eat him. Yeah, I wonder. After the fifth episode, Rambo and his adventures went global. For instance, General Warhawk and Sergeant Havoc abducted a young monk in Tibet, who is to be the next Dalai Lama. Become the next Dalai Lama. The choice. Is yours. Since Warhawk was already in Tibet, he comes to the Indian state of Assam and teams up with a local leader named Rama. When the action in the oriental parts of the world kicks off, Rambo finds himself battling Warhawk in places like Munich and Sydney and all around the world. A few episodes contained fictional stories, but historical and contemporary events influenced the others. Nice knife, Rambo. <laughs> The 80s were full of films with a tie-in cartoon series, but the most surprising one was Rambo. This cartoon had everything a young kid would want, from big, bumbling bad guys and a tough American hero, to explosions aplenty and cool weapons like the AC-130 Spectre gunship, the OV-10 Bronco, the Avro HS-748, and the MiG-21. Rambo was a character who suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder after his experiences in the bloody Vietnam War and it was a real challenge to make such a character suitable for children. The first live-action Rambo film showed that he didn't deliberately kill anyone, rather using his murderous abilities as a last resort, and the cartoon series followed suit, even going a step further and not letting the army veteran kill anyone at all. Strangely, there's also no mention of the Vietnam War in the animated series. What took you so long? It's good to be home. Well, it's only natural that parents would have been displeased with the creators if children were shown the horrors of war. But the showrunners did address some contemporary issues in a covert way. For instance, the West African country of Sierra Leone was plagued with civil wars during the 80s, and the name bears a stark resemblance to Tierra Liber. In the 16th episode, General Warhawk wishes to start an international terrorist training camp in a place called Bagdinia. Does this ring a bell? Anyone? Super Cop. Robocop. Robocop, the animated series, 1988. The 1987 film Robocop is set in a dystopian Detroit where crime has engulfed the city as thick as air. The city government signs a contract with the corporation Omni Consumer Products to privatize the Detroit Police Department. But Omni Consumer Products has a nefarious plan, sending Officer Alex Murphy into an armed confrontation with crime lord Boddicker and his gang. OCP does this in the hope that Murphy will get terminally wounded and that they can use his body to test a cyborg battle machine prototype called Robocop. Their plan succeeds, and Robocop is born. Murphy eventually discovers his parent corporation's evil motives as they plan to terrorize an innocent population, and he decides to turn against his creators. In the live-action film, we saw the weapon ED-209. The cartoon series has an upgraded form of ED-209 called the ED-260, Dr. McNamara designed the ED-260 along with several other technological monsters in the hope of getting financial backing from OCP and getting rid of Robocop 2. During the show, Robocop experiences various troubles from people like Dr. McNamara and criminal gangs like the Brotherhood, who seek to eliminate all droids and robots. The pilot episode begins with Dr. McNamara hiring an insane criminal gang called the Vandals, who he instructs to spread mass violence and crime across the city. 
These circumstances would have allowed him to deploy his ED-260 into the streets, but the ED-260 was a highly unreliable piece of equipment. Naturally, Robocop was to save the day and begin his career in the animated world. You have the right to remain silent. Hey! Paul Verhoeven's film Robocop was not just a science fiction film. It dealt with highly prevalent and relatable issues like corruption, crime, greed, and privatization. The satire on society is showcased in the inversion of morality. We empathize with the human side of the machine, whereas humans themselves have become villainous. The screenplay added dark humor. For instance, in the rape prevention scene when Robocop shoots the rapist in his crotch through the girl's skirt. The film was ahead of its time in the science fiction genre and became a cinematic epic of its own right. So, why shouldn't it deserve an animated series? Robocop was a cop and a robot. Naturally, he was perfectly suited to the animated world. However, unlike shows like Conan the Adventurer and Rambo Force of Freedom, Robocop didn't shy away from dealing with complex topics or themes. The fourth episode, titled The Brotherhood, was a satire on racism, with the bad guys seeking eradication of the race of technology that was fast emerging. Similarly, the tenth episode, titled A Robot's Revenge, deals with terrorism and the Middle East peace process. In this episode, Robocop is tasked with protecting Middle Eastern leaders Prince Zoras and Ilmar, who are to sign a peace treaty, but are under mortal threat of a terrorist attack. Despite these heavy themes, kids loved the show back then, and we still love it now. The series was faster and more powerful than the film, and Detroit was technologically more advanced and filled with robots and droids. The Real Ghostbusters 1986 to 1991. This show serves as a direct sequel to the 1984 film and follows the adventures of the four Ghostbusters, their accountant Lewis, their secretary Janine, and their mascot Slimer. The pilot episode is basically a flashback that links the show to the film. Peter begins to tell the story to a television reporter named Cynthia Crawford. The episode revealed that they had to change into new uniforms because after taking out Gozer, their uniforms became contaminated with frightening amounts of psychokinetic energy. Also, Slimer stuck around with the team, as he was valuable to research and extremely friendly. He ended up becoming their pet and friend, but Peter still disliked him from when he was slimed. But by the end of the episode, Peter started to appreciate Slimer's bravery, as he was able to fight the spectral or ghostly forms of the Ghostbusters. Okay, okay. The episode named Take Two describes the differences between the film and the cartoon series itself. According to the episode, the film was based on the events of the animated series. The episode is a laugh riot with numerous inside jokes about the film. All right, I'm gonna turn over the next card. I just wish I knew what he was planning. For many of us, The Real Ghostbusters was one of the first shows that earned respect and the honor of regular viewing. It was funny, adventurous, scary, and at times, moving. It successfully preserved the spirit of the 1984 film, and the actors who voiced Peter, Ray, Egon, and Winston were well aware of what they were doing and how they had to keep alive the spirits of their live-action counterparts. But any discussion about the Ghostbusters characters is incomplete without talking about Slimer. In the movie, he was called Onionhead, but the show dubbed him Slimer. What say we call you Slimer? It's beyond doubt that the show's first season was also its highest point in terms of story, character development, and humor. But the show wasn't free from faults. Although the first season did great and appealed to kids and adults alike, the creators wanted it to be more kid-friendly. Hi, Mr. Ghostbuster! They wanted younger Ghostbusters, because apparently, kids like to watch other kids on television. Secondly, Slimer was made both more vocal and intelligent. While the first season of the animated show did not define roles for each of the characters, the second season gave them very specific strengths, and so Winston became the driver, Peter became the talker, Ray was the muscle man, and Egon was the brain. In a strange move, Janine's glasses were made circular because kids were supposedly afraid of pointy and sharp things. Having said that, the show was most certainly appealing and entertaining, or else it wouldn't have run for an incredible five years, racking up 173 episodes. Teen Wolf, 1986 to 1988. The 1985 live action film showed a young teenager named Scott Howard and his ability to transform into a werewolf. The curse ran in his family, and it revealed itself to Scott when he almost became an adult. 
He lived in the small town of Beacontown, near Nebraska, and became an overnight superstar in his town and school after he won a basketball game by turning into a wolf. However, the animated show brought a few changes. In it, Scott lived with his grandparents and a younger sister in a town called Wolverton, while in the film, he was an only child. Furthermore, in the film, his identity as a werewolf is known to everyone, but the pilot episode of the animated show revolved around how he was to guard his family's secret. I gotta work fast. The show introduced new characters like Grandpa Howard, who was a constant source of embarrassment for Scott, as he almost never ditched the werewolf form, getting into trouble with neighbors. Grandma Howard was also all for appearing in her werewolf form, but she was an ally to Scott when it came to hiding her husband's secret. She was also a bit of a fortune teller and a witch, and she could brew potions. The most interesting new character was Lupe Howard, Scott's younger sister. She was too young to become a werewolf, but she was always hell-bent on becoming one. The show was made for a younger audience than the film was, and despite this, the creators were brave enough to show toned-down versions of concepts like disability, racism, and even civil rights. Oh no, not again, not... Just before Scott would transform, he would go through a weird feeling, which was nothing but the portrayal of asthma and seizures. Aside from these themes, the show retained the original themes of coming of age. Kids loved the show as creatures like werewolves were usually reserved for elder audiences and live-action films. The show was novel to kids, and parents loved it because it gave their children moral lessons like being true to oneself and respecting others. Police Academy, the series. Hooray! Police Academy, the animated series, 1988 to 1989. The animated story of the bumbling and wacky rookies places focus on the period between the fourth and fifth live-action films of the Police Academy anthology. When a bust goes awry in the opening episode, Captain Harris is sent back to the Academy. He drags Jones, Hightower, Callahan, Zed, Sweetchuck, Tackleberry, Hooks, and of course Mahoney back with him. Mahoney and his protectors of law and disorder are joined by the loyal members of the K-9 Corps. The dog cops include Samson, the bulldog leader, Lobo, the noble yet clumsy husky, Bonehead, the dim-witted giant St. Bernard, Chili Pepper, the excitable Chihuahua, and Shitsi, the only female, a golden retriever permanently suffering an identity crisis. Thank you. These fellows were aided by a new character named the Professor, who invents these crazy and highly advanced gadgets. Together, the team would fight a new set of supervillains like the Claw, Numskull, Mr. Sleaze, Amazona, and above all, the Kingpin, whose intelligence, girth, and stature make him a parody of Marvel's Kingpin. Police Academy was one of the most loved film anthologies, or at least until they stopped paying attention to the script. Despite having many fans, the animated series is not widely known, but that doesn't mean that the show was bad. It starred film favorites Mahoney and Hightower, it had exciting and incredibly strong villains, and the dog unit was something that would appeal to kids and adults, even in the 21st century. The only hiccup seemed to be the absence of Michael Winslow as Larvel Jones. They think it's so romantic. Michael had this super ability to imitate just about any sound effect with his voice, though the actor who played Larvel on the show, Greg Morton, actually did quite a satisfactory job. The heist stories might remind you of Scooby-Doo episodes, but there are tons of differences between the two shows. So, do you remember watching this one? Well, if you ever liked the Police Academy films, we are more than sure that you'd love the animated series as well. Beetlejuice, 1989 to 1991. Tim Burton's 1988 ghost comedy film Beetlejuice grossed over $70 million. Therefore, it wasn't a surprise that the following year, Beetlejuice had its own animated show. Like the film that it was named after and inspired by, the animated series focused on the friendship between a gloomy goth girl named Lydia and the titular ghost friend Beetlejuice. Of course, there were a few changes that were made to make the content more child-friendly. Earth was called Real World in the film, but to save children from the confusion, they dubbed it as Peaceful Pines for the show. Oh, I, I, I just freeze up! <laughs> Bogus, huh? In the movie, Beetlejuice caused a whole lot of trouble for Lydia Dietz and her horrible guardians Charles and Delia. However, the show portrayed Beetlejuice as a best friend to Lydia, and her parents were shown as less selfish and more accessible. A spirit from neither world, Beetlejuice was the ghost with the most, a title that was picked up straight from the film. Are you a ghost too? I'm the ghost with the most, babe. 
He had more powers than other ghosts and could shapeshift, teleport, and conjure objects. An oversimplification of his character sketch would be to say that he was cynical and childish, as he often showed levels of maturity when frequently reciting quotes of philosophical and humanitarian importance. But then again, he was made to look really silly and funny, probably to trigger a burst of laughter in the younger demographic. For instance, when asked to babysit little undead infants, he literally sits on them. Sit on babies for days! I'll have a present for Lydia! While Beetlejuice did his share of mischief, the creators were no less naughty and parodied famous titles like The Wizard of Oz. Could the episodes like Robin Juice of Sure Weird Forest, Wizard of Ooze, Moby Richard, and It's a Wonderful Afterlife be more direct parodies? The success of the 1988 film lured the executives to milk the Beetlejuice cow dry. The series was a huge success when it first aired on ABC, and later became one of the first cartoons to air on the Fox Channel's Fox Kids lineup and was one of the few shows in American TV history to be aired concurrently on two different broadcast networks. It's However, in the quest to make money, they didn't spoil the essence of the source. In fact, they used the cartoon to expand the film's universe. Beetlejuice and Lydia's misadventures gave everyone a good time, but the jokes themselves were rather dark and morbid for a children's show. For instance, there's a scene where Beetlejuice just plucks his eyes out, and another where he plays with worms in a gruesome fashion. Nevertheless, at least he was not as much of a horn dog as he was in the film. The show effectively stands the test of time with its humor, tone, and setting. And let's not forget the subtle lessons that Beetlejuice taught kids. Over a span of two and a half years and 94 episodes, many of us grew up watching this one, and yet today's kids would love it if it aired on Saturday mornings. The Karate Kid, 1989. Just like the movie it is based on, the show focused on apprentice Daniel LaRusso and his mentor, Keisuke Miyagi. However, instead of a tournament to train for, the series had an entirely different set of adventures and quests. The story revolved around a shrine that had mystical healing powers, which was stolen from its home in Okinawa, and it was Mr. Miyagi and Daniel's responsibility to retrieve it. Each episode would follow a similar sequence of events where Mr. Miyagi would get a lead on the shrine's whereabouts. Subsequently, Daniel and a new character in the form of a local Okinawan girl named Taki would follow up on that lead. In these quests, Daniel and Taki would travel around the globe to exotic locations and come face to face with ruthless gangs and criminals who had either obtained or were seeking to obtain the shrine for their own evil purposes. With the help of Taki, Daniel would defeat the bad guys and would often come within an inch of retrieving the shrine. But as the show must go on, the shrine would consistently escape from his grasp. The adventures took the trio to places like the Himalayas, London, Russia, Australia, Mexico, and of course, several parts of America. In almost all the episodes, Mr. Miyagi wears the shoes of the mentor and teaches Daniel various lessons about life as well as karate. For instance, in the sixth episode, named The Paper Hero, Daniel is reduced to near blindness because of a sandstorm he was caught in. So, Miyagi teaches him to use his other four senses to fight. The Karate Kid animated series ran for 13 episodes on NBC's Saturday morning lineup and starred Joey Dedio, Robert Ito, and Janice Kawai. After the success of the 1984 film Karate Kid and its 1986 sequel, Deke Entertainment, Saban Entertainment, and Columbia Pictures Television premiered the animated Karate Kid in 1989, hoping to build on the franchise's popularity. The show ran only from September to December of 1989, and so it was easy to miss altogether. Hey, how about a game of pool? Winner gets the shrine! However, it's nothing like the run-of-the-mill shows of the 80s. Despite the flat, grainy colors and reuse of background shots, the series managed to maintain a level of energy and a style that drew you in. A unique aspect of the show was that apart from using the names of the characters and their relationship, it is largely independent of the films. However, it was certainly not free from faults. The relationship between Mr. Miyagi and Daniel doesn't feel as warm and affectionate as the movies, and it creates a little hurdle while watching the show because it's human nature to compare. Most triumphant. Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventures, 1990-1991 The Bill and Ted anthology saw its latest sequel in 2020 with Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter back as the titular characters. 
For the few who don't know the story of Bill and Ted, it all started with the 1989 film Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventures, which became an instant hit among viewers and critics alike. They were simply two dim-witted students who happened to meet a man from the future named Rufus. Rufus helped them graduate because apparently the future was to be saved by the music of these two bumbling fools, or maybe we shouldn't call them that. The cartoon series follows their adventures as they use their time machine to go back in history and meet several important figures, from Mozart to Marco Polo. The formula for most of the episodes was more or less the same. Evens! What are you so upset about? This one didn't break. Bill and Ted would get into some trouble because they would break something they weren't supposed to, or because they had an assignment that they had no knowledge of, or one of many other such forced stories. The first season of the show was produced by Hanna-Barbera and aired on CBS in 1990. Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter reprised their roles as Ted Logan and Bill S. Preston, respectively, and George Carlin, too, came back as Rufus. However, the second season was produced by Deke Animation City, and they replaced Reeves, Winter, and Carlin with other voice actors. This move was the beginning of the end for this lovable animated series. Some may argue the best episode of the season is probably the one named A Most Excellent Roman Holiday, in which Bill and Ted travel to Rome to obtain a certain translation. Look, the space shuttle. Oh. They outsmart a few gladiators, participate in a chariot race, and unknowingly start a fashion trend. The show was a favorite among children and fans alike because it invited them to take history lessons, but in an accessible, audio-visual mode. Isn't this a new model of learning that edtech companies are using? But let's be real, how many 10-year-olds really watch a cartoon to learn about Mozart or Julius Caesar? So the other and more probable reason why the show fared well was because of its well-crafted storyline, humor, and, yes, great animation. After all, it was a Hanna-Barbera show. Back to the Future, 1991 to 1993. The Back to the Future trilogy is about the adventures of Marty, his girlfriend Jennifer Parker, and the eccentric scientist Dr. Emmett Brown, who converted a DeLorean into a time machine. At the end of the third film, Dr. Brown flies into the sky and disappears in a new steam engine time machine. The animated show serves as a sequel to this, and we see Brown living on a farm in Hill Valley with his wife Clara, their sons Jules and Vern, and the family dog Einstein. In the 1990 film, the DeLorean time machine was destroyed, but Dr. Brown had apparently rebuilt it in the show. The new model had voice-activated time circuits and could travel instantly to different points in time and space. <laughs> Furthermore, it could fold into a small suitcase. In addition to this, they could also travel in the steam engine time machine. Unlike the film, which focused on Marty's family, the show's center of attention is the Brown family. However, Marty still remains the main character and the lead protagonist. Other characters like Jennifer and the film's villain, Biff Tannen, also make appearances. New characters such as the many relatives of McFly, Brown, and Tannen grace the show every now and then too. In contrast, the films focused on Hill Valley and the neighboring areas and didn't delve deep into the character backgrounds or backstories. Interestingly, at every episode's end, Dr. Brown conducted an experiment that was in line with the episode's plot. Did you know that every episode began and ended with a live-action segment? Another show that combined live-action and animation was the Super Mario Bros. Super Show. The Back to the Future trilogy was perfect in every sense of the word. Although many fans wanted a fourth film, Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale chose to reach a middle ground and came up with an animated show that served as a sequel, as well as focusing more on the Brown family, something that was never really explored in the films. The biggest issue with the show remained in voicing the characters. Michael J. Fox didn't return to voice his character in the animated series, and although Christopher Lloyd appeared as Dr. Brown in the live-action segments, he chose to stay away from playing his animated counterpart. The scientist was ultimately voiced by Dan Castellanata, who had worked on shows like The Simpsons and Futurama. Despite being a good show in terms of writing and animation, the target audience was not appropriate. 10 or 12 year olds couldn't appreciate the complex beauties of time traveling. After all, even us adults had issues understanding Christopher Nolan's Interstellar, at least after one watch. Hence, the Back to the Future animated series was a missed opportunity to achieve something special. Ewoks, 1985 to 1986. The Ewoks live in peace on the forest moon of Endor, 
But the peace-loving Ewoks who live on the treetops find themselves in constant battle with their cousins, the Dulocs, who inhabit Endor's swamps. All is not as bad as it seems because Wicket, Nisa, Tebow, and their friends find that they are always learning lessons and having fun while getting caught up in their adventures. The series focuses on characters like Wicket Wisteri Warwick, the youngest of the Warwick family, who is headstrong about becoming a warrior despite his age, so much so that he often gets into trouble. Willie Warwick is a big, fat, gluttonous Ewok, but is unimaginably kind and helpful. And then there's Chief Chirpa and Medicine Man Logre, who lead the Ewoks. On the other hand, the villains include King Gornish and Queen Urga of the Dulocs. And we are the Traveling Jindas. No doubt you've heard of us. <laughs> the show is extremely rich with other brilliant creatures like the Jindas, who are a race of canid aliens, and an animal-eating demonic tree called the Rach, amongst many others. My God! Give it to me! In the first episode, a drought strikes the forest, and Morag uses it to get his revenge on Chief Chirpa. He forces Isrina, Queen of the Wisties, to start a forest fire. The episode taught the kids about the dangers of forest fires, and there's genuine suspense as a blaze approaches the village. The show was visually brilliant, with beautiful vibrant colors and tree-lined backgrounds. However, while some episodes feel rich in story and suspense, the others feel dull and boring. The animation legend Paul Dini, who worked on Batman the Animated Series, wrote the more brilliant episodes, including the first and second. However, the episodes that Bob Corral wrote feel rather weak and hollow. The animated show is set before the events of the original Star Wars film and Caravan of Courage. After the series ended, the penultimate episode Battle for the Sunstar was aired as the season finale. It seeks to build a link between the show and Return of the Jedi. Well. Ah! <laughs> Highlander, the animated series, 1994 to 1996. After a meteorite collides with Earth, it causes a series of nuclear reactions and humanity gets almost wiped out. The only survivors of this catastrophe are the immortal Highlanders. They call themselves Jedators and pledge to stop fighting for the eternal prize and vow to save humanity. However, one of the immortals named Corten still seeks the prize and wishes to dominate Earth. He succeeds, though there is a prophecy foretelling of the birth of one last Highlander who will defeat Cortan and free the world from his dictatorial rule. You are the last of the MacLeods. Highlander the Animated Series is a loose spin-off and sequel of the 1986 film of the same name. This series did well on the action front, incorporating non-lethal means of fighting like martial arts and swordplay. The visual aesthetics were vibrant and engaging, but the plot lacked continuity, which created confusion. What we are trying to say is that if you watch this show as an independent piece of work, then it would definitely win you over. Much like Conan the Barbarian, the Highlander characters were created for an adult audience, or at least college kids. However, the extreme cartoon creators of the 90s saw it fit to bring these stories into the animated world and attempt to make them suitable for kids. This experiment didn't always prove successful, because if you remove the basic features of gritty and dark literature to make it morally and politically correct, then you're doing something absolutely criminal. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.